and welcome back to the Modern Android Development Panel. Um, so we have an excellent panel with too many people to introduce, but hopefully there's some familiar faces and we have skills in Compose, Jetpack, testing, architecture, more Compose, more Compose, um, Studio, um, lots of great panelists here. So we're looking forward to answering your questions. Um, so once again, if you want to ask questions, you can do so on the live stream by um, asking with the, um, in the chat, or you can do it on Twitter by um, using the hashtag AskAndroid. We only have 20 minutes for this live panel, so let's jump straight into questions, please. Can I get the questions up? Please? No questions. OK, there we go. Uh, the first one is coming in. It says, is Compose the future of Android? Can okay. I try? Uh, I don't think it's uh, just the future. I think it's already the present. Uh, so one of the things that we mentioned in the keynote is if um, you're just learning Android, start with Compose. If you're building a new app, start with Compose. Wait, that's what we said in the keynote. <laughs> <laughs> we still believe in it. Oh, yeah, you are there. So I'm going to push you on that. Is there any situation where you shouldn't use it? Uh, yes, we are aware that uh, we're still working on the view parity um, story, so there might be things that uh, right now you can only implement in views. Uh, so those would be the specific parts in your app where you would still uh, go back to views. And I would add to that, please use Compose so you can tell us what's missing, so we can edit, so you don't have to ask us what's missing anymore. <laughs> Uh, unless anyone wants to build on that, then maybe we can go to our next question, which comes in as, how is the Android team trying to ease the learning curve for native Android development? Because Android is hard. You're DevRel, you can answer that. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing about it? Well, <laughs> we're trying to make it easier. We, we understand that. And I think that's where Jetpack comes from, right? I'm expecting you have some thoughts here as well that we want to kind of try and take on the things that you all had to do for yourself and try and package them up into libraries that you can use and, and like, you know, have our best practices baked into them. So I think you know, hopefully you've seen a lot of that in our, our modern kind of Android development approach, which is make, taking on some of that complexity for you. Uh, so there's that. Uh, I think we've been more opinionated in some of our guidelines. I think for a long time, we're famously a little bit it's up to you. You do what you want. You know, you bring whatever architecture you want. We'll give you the interaction with the, um, the system, the platform, but your own architecture or whatever. Uh, and I think that's changed. We've become a lot more opinionated. And hopefully, that helps people um, at least have somewhere to start from. We're not saying you necessarily always have to follow the letter of whatever developer.android.com sa um, says. Sometimes you'll have to deviate depending on your needs. But at least we give you a bit more um, recommendations there. That's my thoughts. Anyone? I'll pile a little bit on. So, you know, the core of model Android development is really about making it as easy as possible. And it is difficult to um, build apps across all these form factors. But we're trying to be opinionated about the best tools that you can use, the most productive experiences from Studio to Kotlin to Jetpack. We also want to build APIs that you don't have to think as much about. Uh, so backwards compared across Jetpack. Uh, when it comes to building for large screen layouts, trying to build APIs like Windows side classes. Things that mean you don't have to think about every dimension of your app. Um, but at its core, it is modern Android development and driving as much consistency about the skills you learn and reuse across all the different form factors and APIs that make it easy and tools that really uh, make it easy to build the right apps. Yeah, something I just want to emphasize that Nick said really quickly is that so we are very opinionated and it's more that we're trying to give you solutions like if you don't care, we have a solution for you. But if you do care, it's okay, you can do your own thing, right? Like there's not one way of doing things. We just want to make that very clear. By the way, one last thing. Anything we add also adds up to the complication. So it's always a difficult choice between do you want to add something that makes something easier or what, which also happens to make the overall story harder. It's always hard for us to find, like, just because we are not doing certain libraries, one that doesn't mean they're not important. It's just that it adds to the overall complexity. So we try to be very conservative on the things we do. Cool. I hope that helps. Uh, next up, we have a question saying, any plans to make UI testing easier? Um, I will ask this person if they've tried out Compose, because it <laughs> made things much, much better in general. Uh, plans, um, are we not talking about future? We haven't <laughs> talked about that. Uh, we are looking into a screenshot testing. Uh, it's a hot topic right now in the community and everywhere. Um, so we know it's kind of necessary for Compose as well. Um, and apart from that, we are 
you know, improving the guidance uh, all the time, documentation, samples, code labs. We're probably going to have um, video series and, and a code labs uh, pathway next year. So yeah, definitely something we're investing in. Maybe I'll pile on <laughs> three more things as well. Um, we really think about we want to build APIs that mean you don't even have to test some of the things that you're building for the UI. Again, window size class is a great example. Things that we take away the complexity through. And we also think about UI testing really in two major forms. The inner loop, where you're doing your build edit config. And obviously, we've made investments with live edit there with the preview that you saw and being able to preview across multiple devices. And then an outer loop, where you're coordinating with the rest of your team. That's unit testing and testable services and in the future, hopefully, some screenshot testing support. So we do want to make it a lot easier. We know it's not trivial, uh, but we're investing across all the major fronts. And on the uh, setup side, we have the Gradle Managed Virtual Devices, which you know, if you do need to run UI tests across a different set of devices, we make it a lot easier now to have your test just run on the CI without having to manually configure ABDs. OK, uh, next question is, are there any efforts to make Compose compiler more intelligent with state reads? It's really easy to accidentally create a poorly performing UI by accidentally reading state, e.g. in an animation. Yeah, we should ask Leon what he's been doing. Uh, is Leon in the room? No? Do we have anybody who wants to answer that? So we do have the, I mean, making Compose more clever, sure. But also, we have just introduced the compose tracing, so now you can like see your composition in your uh, trace results, and that actually like even my my like, personal app sometimes you don't really understand why it is recomposing, and then with, with tracing that actually five, five becomes very very easy to figure out why is it like when what changes it starts to retrace. Uh, we're gonna add more to that, like make it more usable, but I think that part is frankly more important than Compose trying to get more and more clever because there's limits to that. Uh, versus if we give you all the information on what's happening, you can fix it. So we don't need to do anything. Yeah. Uh, kind of have that work with views for like whatever 15 years, why not with Compose? Yeah. It's kind of a hard problem as well, right? Because you sometimes need to read state like in certain places and it's hard to tell when's accident and when's like intentional. So I think part of this is the mental shift of like getting used to the state read model and understanding how that works and using tools to detect when it's not working. So interesting question. Uh, next up, we have a question. Would it be possible to give any insight into what capabilities to expect soon with the Glance framework or approximately when it might reach beta? Anyone want to take Glance? I can take another shot at this one as well. Um, so yeah, the Glance framework, for those who don't know, is really about an abstraction, a composable-like abstraction to creating widgets across multiple um, runtimes. Um, and really, what we're trying to do is extend it across a number of runtimes. We're largely, largely focused on large screens and phones in the first iteration, and we have a relatively stable API that we're building out there. But the idea is with a common programming model, which is actually the central element of modern Android development, if you like. You learn a, a few concepts that we apply in many different places. We abstract you from the underlying implementation, which is things like remote views. And we want to extend this across all the places that Android runs. But again, we're really starting first on large screen and phone large screen because there's so much space for glance developments. And of course, I keep on forgetting to say, and where, uh, with tiles and complications. So that's, that's where we started today. Uh, we've actually got a reasonable amount of work to do to make it easy to build and test um, glanceable components. Um, so stay tuned. Cool, thanks. Uh, next question is, are baseline profiles available for Compose or only for XML? I can get that one. Uh, so I'm not sure if the intention of the person asking is uh, to know if they're available by default or out of the box for Compose or XML, or if they're available in general. So let me answer both questions. So first of all, baseline profiles are not tied to any view system. They can work with any part of your app. Any, where, any code that you have in your app can be optimized through baseline profiles, and so it it doesn't matter if you're using Compose or XML. Now, to answer the other question, is it um, available out of the box? Uh, Compose was, was one of the first libraries where we actually shipped a baseline profile um, rule set for the library itself, so for all the uh, building blocks of uh, composable um, views. Um, but we also now ship baseline profiles with other Android X libraries, so many of the libraries are already covered. Now, that said, you do get those rules by default. But in the best case scenario, you will regenerate or ge generate a baseline profile for your specific app anyway, in addition to those rules coming from the libraries, so that all the code that you write 
will be covered by a baseline profile. Doesn't matter if it's compose code, backend code, view code. Um, if you haven't seen the talk today, you should watch it. It's all explained how to do it for your app. Yeah. Also, recycle view has. So I'm pretty sure it's got added. Well yeah, a lot of the Android X libraries but, are in yeah, the rules. Yeah. I highly recommend doing it for your app. Like the gains we are seeing is amazing across yeah. Google Apps. So one more shout out, please, please use baseline profiles. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question is, if sending activity context to a view model is bad practice, how can I request a file URI using file provider since that would be in the data layer? Want to take this? Yeah. Sure. I mean, you, you, you can get to the context. This is just doesn't need to be activity context. Does it require activity context to file your access? You just need an application context, which is fine to access from your view model. It's just the, the hierarchy of but the life cycle of things, you have like your whole application that lives the longest and like one, few, one layer less view models lives throughout the reincarnation of your activity and then under that the activity. So if you pass this activity to the view model, it is bad because that will stay alive. But your view model also has the application on top of it, which is a context that should be enough to access to file access. So yeah, don't, don't use the activity, use the application scope, and then you're fine. I think a, a common misconception here is that you can on, only access the context from the activity. This is something that we, that we see a lot. So if someone needs to do something outside of the UI, they think of the Android view model because it has a context. So um, it's important to know that you can grab a context in your data layer. You don't have to grab it from the UI. Um, you can do it manually or using dependency injection for that. So I think that's probably where the, the, um, the question comes from. And um, actually, the Android view model is something that we just released a bunch of uh, very, very, very opinionated uh, recommendations, best practices for architecture. And actually, we recommend that you don't use the Android, uh, the Android view model and only the view model. Uh, because it can lead to bad, uh, bad patterns to uh, grab context or use context in, in view models. And yeah, just, just to be clear. <laughs> We're not deprecating okay. Android view model. <laughs> yeah. Just yeah. so you know. I mean, I, I think that the, like, it's one of the challenges we have with all the recommendations is that we don't necessarily know how complex your application is or how many other libraries you adopted. Like, you know, if you're using Hilt, for example, or Anvil Dagger, yeah, you just use a view model. But like, if you're not using dependency injection libraries that we provide or other people provide, suddenly, yeah, like Android view model gives you an application context, which is really handy. Uh, so that's why, like when Roman was saying, you, know, you don't need to follow what we recommend because it's very hard for us to figure out how much you follow. Uh, so always take them with a grain of salt. It's in good but context. <laughs> Keep the day job. <laughs> uh, any plans to run Compose UI tests without devices? Uh, any plans? I mean, you can do it today. Uh, you can run UI tests on RoboElectric. Um, that's the end of the, of the <laughs> that's the answer, <laughs> to be honest. Um, this is something that we want to support more uh, because it makes almost not, no sense to use a, a device to run UI tests if they are um, pure isolated composed tests. Um, but you know, the truth is you can do it right now. Or snapshot testing might be, or screenshot testing might help you here as well. If the question is about screenshot testing, it's an interesting moment for, thank you for that, Nick. Um, <laughs> so the, um, what the community is using right now in um, host site screenshot testing is a library called Paparazzi. Um, right now, as of today, I don't think it's compatible with API 33. So uh, there are some forks going on and, and yeah, it's in an interesting moment. Yeah, uh, that, definitely, that, I, I recommend you, sh you check it out. It's super yeah, that library super relies on a few private APIs, right? <laughs> Should we open that <laughs> kind of worms? <laughs> Maybe not here, but. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so Paparazzi uses Layout Lib, which is part of Android Studio. It's not officially supported, but I mean, we're very aware that they are using it. So if we 
are about to break it, they would know uh, for sure. So, so Tor, when will, when will it be officially supported? Uh, we don't talk about future releases. <laughs> <laughs> I tried. Uh, next question comes in is the app actions API allows you to deep link into your app. How should this be handled in a compose app? Okay. <laughs> so I mean blank faces. <laughs> right. So how we should handle deep links in a compose app? Is that app action, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so if you happen to use navigation compose, it handles for you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, you don't use need to do navigation it. Navigation Compose is the answer, is that? Yeah, use Navigation Compose and it's handled for you. Uh, okay, and next question comes in is what do we use for TV Android development? XML question mark? Maybe I can uh, take this. Um, so I think right now there is lean back of using XML, uh, but we're making now the first steps towards uh, Compose for TV. So I think the first alpha release of Compose for TV was launched a couple of weeks ago. So yeah, we've got uh, big plans for it. Yeah, I think just to expand on that a little bit, I think our goal is to bring Compose to everywhere you build Android UI. So expect that to be our answer going forward is Jetpack Compose. So invest in learning it now and it will hopefully extend to all the platforms you care about. And you just answered the next question. Oh, including Look at that. Automotive. <laughs> Yeah, so the next question is, can we use Compose in, they can't see the next one, so. <laughs> can we use Compose in Android automotive apps? Uh, yeah, so we want to bring Compose uh, everywhere. We want to unify development, <laughs> right, to make it easier. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's it's okay. um, no, but it's, it's interesting because, you know, of course, we're not talking about the future, so we're not making any promises and all that, but it's also more than UI, right? Like so when? Some folks, shh, stop it. <laughs> uh, but the Compose model, like this, this highly declarative and reactive model is very interesting beyond on UI, so there are also areas where we'd love to see more of Compose. And I know there have been folks in the community looking at UPY and some of your coworkers uh, who've been uh, looking at using Compose for yeah, non-UI stuff or other types of UI. So expect more to come. Uh, we just have to take them one at a time. If I can add one thing, because like, we've been getting questions around roadmap and stuff. Uh, we do have the Compose roadmap, like a high level uh, overview of it uh, online. What is it? geo.gle slash compose dash roadmap, or just Google for it. Uh, and then there you'll be able to see like what is in focus for us right now, what is in, in backlog, and what we've just shipped. So, I so we do talk about yeah. future plans. We do. We talk about some, some of them. If plans. it's not in the roadmap on the website, don't ask, because yeah. <laughs> you know the answer. We talk about some future plans. Yes. Okay. Sean's crying inside. <laughs> <laughs> um, sorry. One of the things, just again, to stress the point, Compose is important to us because we do want to expand across everywhere that Android runs. You already heard us talk about glanceables before as well. It's not just about the programming paradigm, it's about the tool chain as well. Previews, live edit, everything that you get. So we are sort of investing so that you learn one set of tools, practices, and skills. And basically, you get the benefits of those wherever Android runs. So you should expect us to see, uh, see us pushing down this path more and more. Um, obviously, Wear 1.0, um, stable for Compose, just came out recently. And, and this is true for Wear, everything I just said. So yes, Compose matters. OK, next question. Uh, which layer is better for handling analytics events? Is there a, is there a best analytics layer? Um, I would say data. I mean, handling uh, events. It depends. You it's um, you capture them in the UI probably, maybe in the view model, maybe in the data layer. So I don't think there's an absolute answer to that, if I understand it correctly. It depends. What do you need analytics for? Yeah, but you use analytics across all all the layers. So okay. <laughs> um, we have two minutes left, so let's go to the next one. Are there any plans on previews working with Composables having view models passed as a parameter? I think they already do. I think it works right if you have a parameterless view model. But it's um, so but nice if you don't. recommendation is that you don't, is yeah. that you normally have a stateful and a stateless pair of Composables. Do you want to? Um, what? Who are you looking at, Nick? Me? <laughs> oh, is that You're Jay. OK, sorry. Yeah, go for it. No, um, I think for previews, um, you know, uh, we're, we're, we're trying to you know, compose first for the, for the previews. And so we're aware, obviously, we're aware a lot of users are still using XML. So we are kind of exploring that as well. But I think if you're using compose in, in Kotlin, that's the, the preferred path. Um, 
I can't promise any, anything in the future, but I think it's definitely aware of us that we have to do both XML and Kotlin for some time going forward. But yeah, it's much better if you don't, um, um, if you have two versions of the same compo uh, composable, one using view model and one stateless, so that you can not only preview it much uh, easier, but also test it in isolation. And next question is, is there a method to quickly convert an SVG to a composed path? So an SVG is more than just a path. There's a lot more information. So a composed path by itself cannot represent an SVG. Now, if you just want the path data that's inside an SVG, I guess you would depend on how you load that SVG. Uh, there are parsers that will give you an Android.graphics path, and you can convert that to a composed path, because composed paths are just an Android.graphics.path under a different name. Uh, so we have extension functions, so you can go back and forth between the two. Uh, if you want to do more than that, uh, you will need another library that doesn't exist yet, as far as I know. I guess that's a good feature request. <laughs> <laughs> we have enough work. <laughs> Talk to my PM. <laughs> Who's that? <laughs> Um, so unfortunately, we've run out of time right now. So I'm going to just close by saying thank you very much to our panelists for answering all of your modern Android development questions. Um, for folks on the live stream, thank you for watching. And we'll be back on the live stream in November at the next stop for ADS, where we're going to be in London to talk about form factors. So thanks very much for joining us.